Okay, very good. Okay, so my name is Alza Urkip. Uh, it's hard to believe, but I've been in this institution for almost 20 years. I started in 1999, and this institution has changed for the better, and we're going up. We're going up at a fast pace. Uh, I'm a professor in the electrical and computer engineering department, and I realize that I'm the opening act for the better presentations to come uh, by our young students, by our junior faculty. So I wanted to take some time and talk a little bit about what engineering is, what it is to me, where do I stand in this engineering world. And I also wanted to give you a flavor of some of the projects that we've been doing, uh, particularly looking at networks, understanding and engineering networks from wireless networks to social networks. I'm also a proud mom of two teenagers, uh, two teenage daughters, uh, and they and their friends often ask me, what is engineering? Isn't it a boring subject? And I say, on the contrary, it's, it's one of the best jobs in the world, and I hope I can convince the non-engineers in the room that it's the best job in the world. Now, what is engineering? Okay, so if, you know, the dictionary definition of engineering is application of scientific knowledge to solve real world problems. And you'll often see engineering uh, together with science, right? Science and engineering. What's the difference between science and engineering? What does a scientist do? What does an engineer do? Well, um, scientists' goal is to understand the universe and to create knowledge to understand the universe, whereas an engineer takes that knowledge and uses it to solve real-world problems by designing and building things. So, uh, you know, a scientist maybe looks like the one on the left, uh, and an engineer, you know, interestingly, I was searching for cartoon engineers uh, in the internet, and everything that came up had a hard hat and kind of building. Well, there are some engineers who do that, but many of the engineers look like me, maybe in shabbier clothes, uh, you know, sitting in an office in front of a computer with pen and pencil. Um, so we do a lot of interesting things. Now, what does an engineer do? You know, okay, so it solves real world problems. How does an engineer do it? Uh, well, I think the first and the most important step, or one of the most important steps of engineering is taking that real world problem, which is very complex, and abstracting it out. You know, what's the, what's the essence of that problem? And it's very important to come up with an abstract model that's tractable so you can understand and study it but it's complicated enough that it captures some of the essences of the real world. So this is the art of engineering, if you will. Uh, now, once you have a good abstract model, the next step is to understand that model and come up with solutions. And an engineer has a lot of tools at her disposal, uh, such as um, you know, many scientific fields from biology to physics to chemistry, and certainly math, a lot of math you know, which is what makes it fun, uh, to uh, understand um, this abstract problem and devise solutions, taking into account practical constraints. Now, practical is very important here. We just don't want to come up with any solution. We want to come up with solutions that realize that the real world has these constraints, whether they're, you know, energy, whether they're computational constraints, the materials you can use, so these are very important um, in understanding engineering problems. Now, computational tools are very important as well, and my dad was a civil engineer, and he spent a good part of his career using this computational tool. Does anybody know what this is? <laughs> yeah. So my dad used to go on and on how he would kind of, um, you know, compute uh, using slide rule. I never got to see them, but. Uh, you know, I certainly use computers and, and more and more sophisticated computational tools, which we call artificial intelligence, machine learning. These are all the tools at an engineer's disposal. And at the end of the day, the engineer has to ensure that the design solution works in the real world. So, and never is the solution done in a one-shot basis. There's a constant feedback loop that the engineer has to go through. So we. We abstract our problem, we solve it, and then we have to build and test and send it out to the real world, right? And the real world tells us that our solution works in certain ways but doesn't work in certain other ways, so we have to get it back to our 
engineering domain, this abstract domain, refine our model, refine our solution. And rarely this is done by one person. It takes a team of engineers to do all of this, right? And it takes a team of engineers to communicate within uh, the team, but it also takes the team of engineers to talk to people who have this real world problem. So engineering involves art, it involves communication. Certainly communication skills are very important. That's why it's the best job in the world. And it involves math, I love math. <laughs> Okay, so what do I do? Where do I stand in this engineering world? Um, now, in high school, you know, as you've realized, you know, I was a good student, I loved math. Uh, but I didn't wanna be just, I, I shouldn't say just, but I didn't wanna be a mathematician working on pure math problems. I wanted to use math to do things. So engineering was the natural choice for me, and I went into electrical engineering. And in my area is, can be called in general networks. And I stand more on the side of abstract modeling and solving uh, problems using that abstract model. But I also collaborate with many other engineers in understanding the practical problems, practical constraints. And once in a while, we'll go out and build things um, as well. Um, so certainly I have physics and I have a lot of math at my disposal, but also a lot of the computational tools as well. So today I wanna give you a flavor of the kinds of things that I've been working on. Um, and I wanna kind of give two examples, one from wireless networks, uh, which is an area that I've spent uh, throughout my career. I wanna tell you an, um, an earlier uh, work that we did when I started my career at NYU, which kind of really jump-started my career and went on for, uh, uh, for almost two decades, and I want to tell you a little bit about social networks um, in an area that we have started getting into recently. Now, before I tell you about my work, you know, I want to tell you how your phone works, right? You know, 30-second introduction to wireless, wireless 101. Well, um, so any wireless system is going to follow um, a certain kind of infrastructure, and the way it works is that there are base stations, or if you're using Wi-Fi, there are access points that your phone communicates with. So whenever you wanna make a call, your phone connects to a base station, and then the base station takes um, your signals wherever they need to go. Similarly, if you wanna download a YouTube video on your phone, you'll receive it over the wireless link uh, to your base station. So if I wanted to text Yelena, we couldn't do it directly, it has to go through the base station. And that's the basic uh, uh, structure that all wireless networks um, abide by. Now our idea, again, uh, when I started my uh, career uh, here, was to look at wireless networks and, and try to solve this problem of having unreliable wireless links. So, when a phone is trying to talk to the base station, that wireless link is typically unreliable because you know, we move around, the environment changes, signals can get blocked. Um, so then what happens? You, know, you don't wanna lose the communication, right? So you either need to find another base station to connect to, or you need to somehow try to repair uh, that link. And our solution um, was kind of a very naive one, if you will, a very simple one, we said, well, there are other phones nearby. Why don't I use them to help me out? You know, they're around me. You know, they can overhear me. Maybe they can forward my information to the base station. And then, um, and then maybe when I'm in a bad spot, um, you know, uh, one mobile, you know, Yelena helps me, and when she's in a bad spot, I help her out. So it works out for both of us, and it improves communication for for both of us. Now, of course, devil is in the details, right? It took us many, many, many years, uh, you know, many, many students, many papers to, to actually nail this down, get an abstract model, show that it works. Uh, and this area um, called cooperative networking was in fact uh, pioneered by, by NYU, myself and other researchers. And, and we had many, many students, many talented students, uh, you know, collectively, me and Carl, my colleagues won several awards. We had important papers, and we did, in fact, build uh, test beds. And, and some of our ideas Im, uh, impacted industry standardization and inspired 
different wireless technologies based on this idea of cooperation, you know? Sometimes uh, cooperating mobile, sometimes cooperating base stations, uh, but this kind of idea made it uh, itself into uh, reality. Of course, um, now we're part of a much bigger center called NYU Wireless, and we're at the forefront of wireless research. And we're looking into 5G wireless, that's the next generation of wireless, where it's no longer humans communicating, it's machines communicating. Whether as an in Internet of Things, your fridge orders milk, you know, when it realizes that you're out of milk, or maybe kind of more impactful solutions such as healthcare, uh, wildlife monitoring, uh, you name it. We're also looking at robotics applications, industrial automation, where wireless is an important component to make autonomy among the robots. Autonomous driving, augmented reality, virtual reality. So now we're going beyond humans communicating and wireless link is still uh, an important part of it. So next, I wanna kind of switch gears a little bit and I wanna tell you a little bit about a recent project that we've started working on which is look at, looking at social networks and in particular privacy in social networks. Now, of course, we're all worried about online privacy, right? We're worried about you know, Facebook selling our data, Google, cell phone companies. And the kind of privacy that I'm gonna uh, address here maybe goes back to the Netflix Grand Challenge. Who here remembers the Netflix Grand Challenge? A few people. So, about a little over a decade ago, Netflix wanted to improve its recommendation systems. So it said, I'm gonna provide data to researchers so that they could come up with better recommender systems than I can. Um, so to do that, Netflix provided uh, users and the movies that they liked and the stars that they gave, uh, made it available to researchers. But in order to protect uh, privacy of users, removed user identity. Okay, so they, they thought that that would keep anonymity of the users. Little did they know that there were a lot, a lot of researchers out there who went into public databases like Internet Movie Database, figured out uh, you know, people that with their own identities, what they did, how they rated the movies, and were able to match and figure out many users' identities on Netflix. This caused a big uproar, there were some uh, lawsuits filed, there were similar incidents happening with AOL, removing the, making available the, the search data by removing identity of users. Again, the same thing. Using publicly available information, it was uh, possible to de-anonymize the users. And more recently, we see similar kinds of privacy issues happening in social networks. Uh, we all have our um, professional identities on LinkedIn. Right? We also have our personal social networks such as Facebook, Instagram. And we wouldn't want our professional and personal identities to be matched with one another. But it turns out that it's not too difficult to match identities across social uh, networks. There's been uh, you know, several uh, researchers showing that this is possible. So our approach has been, again, looking at this practical problem and trying to understand the fundamentals by abstracting it out. So we've recently started looking at database and graph matching in social networks. So imagine two databases, such as Rotten Tomatoes and Netflix rankings. In one database, you know the identities of the users. In the other one, you don't. But certainly, there's, a, there's some relationship among these two databases. Similarly, you can envision two social networks. In one, you know the identities. In the other, you don't. But certainly, there's a relation. They're not the identical uh, social networks, but they're related. So can we use properties of these databases and social networks to actually map uh, the users? So what we're doing is we're coming up with tractable yet realistic mathematical models, we're trying to understand some of the fundamental limits and algorithms. In particular, when can you match the users? And that's not a good thing, right? So how do we protect anonymity if we don't want users to, match, uh, to be matched? Maybe we could add some noise, but we still wanna maintain the usefulness of these databases. And then we're also thinking about good applications of this. You know, maybe matching these databases uh, could be desirable. My husband is a cancer researcher, and he says that one of the important problems they face is that they have a database of childhood cancer survivors, 
but they cannot uh, constantly monitor all of them, right? And they have a database of adult cancer patients, right? So these databases are anonymized, you know, researchers aren't supposed to know the identities, but if you could match these two databases, then you could learn what happens to childhood cancer survivors when they become adults, and it could be a very useful information. Um, so I hope I've kind of managed to convince the non-engineers in the crowd that engineering is an exciting field. Uh, it involves artistry, uh, it involves uh, communication, it involves a lot of technical tools, uh, but it also involves talking to a lot of people. And with that, I'm uh, happy to take some questions. Thank you.